again, I'm Harrison Keller. I'm the Deputy to President for Strategy and Policy here. And uh, uh, we're delighted now for, uh, to introduce Derek Thompson, uh, Senior Editor at The Atlantic. Uh, Derek, uh, you know his work um, primarily writes about economics, labor markets, and the media. He's also a weekly contributor to NPR's Here and Now and appears regularly on CBS. Um, uh, Derek has received several national honors, including uh, 2016 Best in Business for Columns and Commentary from the Society of uh, American Business Editors and Writers, and uh, this year released uh, a book, Hitmakers, The Science of Popularity in an Age of Distraction. And, um, and uh, most recently, and relevant to our conversations today, um, he wrote a piece in The Atlantic titled The Myth of American Universities as Inequality Fighters that uh, covered some of the preliminary hi highlights of the climb research. So thank you uh, for joining us today, Derek, and I'll hand the mic over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I am so unbelievably excited for this panel uh, to be talking to two intellectual heavyweights, and um, I want to preface by the briefest of possible preambles that um, typically uh, when you have one of these panels and one person seems to be talking a lot more than other people, the audience can get a little bit skittish and wonder if other pe members of the panel feel diminished or, or awkward. In this case, uh, David and I uh, conferred and decided that the best way to get into this subject would be to essentially to yield the floor to Raj for the first <laughs> 10, 15, you're welcome. We'll see 20 <laughs> minutes um, right. uh, to talk a little bit about his career, uh, the mobility report cards paper, um, and uh, the research that he's currently working on. Uh, so, uh, Raj, the first question for you essentially is, I, I want you to set up this most recent project by talking a little bit about why you chose to focus on social mobility in the first place, and then also once you're looking at the entire pipeline of social mobility, and you're looking at the effect of neighborhoods and residential segregation and the power of teachers, why go so deep on colleges? Why are colleges such an important part of this pipeline? And then maybe take us through uh, the papers that you've been putting out. Sounds good. Thanks, Derek. And f first of all, let me just say thanks to everyone for being here. As a researcher, there's nothing more inspiring than seeing your work having some impact on practice and thinking about ways in which we can really improve people's lives. And so I think there's no group better positioned to make a difference in higher education than the group of people assembled in this room. And it's really a privilege for me, John, Dave, and all the other researchers in the room to, to participate in this effort. So let me start, Derek, by, with the first question you asked on how I got into these issues. Like many of us, um, you know, I think many of us are motivated to work on the topics we work on by our own personal experiences. And in my case, um, my family, my parents came to the US in search of the American dream, like many other immigrants. I was reminded in particular, hearing about people's stories and conversations today about a story my father would often tell us as kids about his experience in coming to the US. So my dad grew up in a, a really poor family in a village in South India. And he um, would tell a story about when he received admission to the operations research or statistics PhD program at UW-Madison in this Indian village. And that was like a great moment getting that letter in the mail. But because his family you know, didn't really know much about America, Madison, et cetera, uh, they said that he had to consult the town astrologer to decide whether <laughs> you know, this actually was a sensible thing to do. And my dad tell us how the astrologer told him, you know, this is a terrible idea because the ship you're going to take to the United States, I can see this when you're reading, I'm reading your palm, it's going to sink along the way. And so my dad somehow, you know, was interested in statistics even before he got to the Madison uh, PhD program, concluded like that was probably quite unlikely. So he decided to, to go ahead anyway. And, you know, that's made all the difference in our family. I see that, you know, in my own outcomes relative to the opportunities my cousins have had, for example. And I think many of us have experiences like that that really show us the power of America, the power of higher education to transform our lives. And so motivated by that kind of personal background, I've always had uh, an interest in understanding issues of poverty and opportunity and how we can give more kids the opportunity to succeed. And I think a lot of our recent focus and, and interest in this area from a scientific perspective 
is motivated by that trend that John showed initially in his presentation of the fading American dream, where you can see for the generation of people coming to the US uh, when my parents did in the 60s and 70s, America really was a land of opportunity where you felt like you could get ahead and your kids could have a better standard of living than you did. But today for many immigrants and for, for, native, uh, for Americans you know, growing up here, that's, that's much less the case. And so motivated by that, um, a group of us researchers at Stanford, uh, myself, John at Brown, Nathan Hendren at Harvard, uh, a group of researchers, we've come together to form what we're calling the Equality of Opportunity Project, which is a project that essentially aims to figure out at the broadest level how we can reverse that trend and revive the American dream. And the unifying theme underlying the work we do in a, in a team of about 20 people um, is to use big data and various interdisciplinary sort of methods. You know, we work with people in sociology, education, economics. We don't really have a particular methodological bent other than wanting to use the best data possible and the best empirical methods to, without any ideological bias, try to figure out how we can revive uh, opportunity for as many kids as possible. And I think we're really at an unprecedented moment in social science where the availability of the types of data that John and Dave were showing you, where we can link these large administrative data sets and look at information from tax records, uh, social security records, and other, other work we're doing, use data from Facebook, for example, to look at patterns in a much more granular and precise way than was ever possible in the past is really transformative. So my sense is social science and this sort of research and its impact on policy is going to change dramatically uh, over the next decade. And I think we're really at the forefront of it uh, with this effort. So in the Equality of Opportunity Project, uh, as you mentioned, Derek, you know, we're kind of thinking about the pipeline that is involved in producing opportunity from birth to adulthood. So we see higher education as a very important part of this pipeline. But in much of our earlier work, we focused on conditions like the neighborhood in which you grow up and how that influences your life chances or how the quality of the teachers you have in kindergarten or in elementary school affect kids' long-term outcomes. And so our sense from looking at this data is that all of these various factors accumulate to really greatly dramatic, uh, to greatly affect kids' uh, long-term outcomes. Uh, why are we focused on higher education in particular here? And I think as many of us recognize, higher education is both a key force um, in, in this pipeline, but it's also importantly one of the key things that's manipulable. So when we look from a correlational perspective, if we look, for instance, across cities in America where we've computed statistics on which places in America have the highest rates of upward mobility, you find things like places that have strong family structures or a lot of social capital have a lot of upward mobility. So that is useful to know. But from a policy perspective, it's difficult to figure out how you manipulate those factors. In contrast, in higher education, we have the sense that, yeah, if we can figure out what works and if we can make the decision that we want to admit more low-income kids to this school that's adding a lot of value, that is in the hands of people who are essentially in the room, right? There are college presidents and boards that can choose to allocate more dollars to financial aid or to expand one program relative to another. And so it's very actionable. And I think that made it an attractive setting for us to study. And so what we started out doing, uh, as many of you know, is compile statistics on mobility rates across colleges in America in this paper on mobility report cards, which we released in January of uh, this year, which basically showed for every college in America, what is the income distribution of the parents of kids entering each college? and what are the outcomes of the children in terms of their earnings at each college. And so putting those two sets of data together, you could ask basically what do the mobility rates of each college look like? That is what fraction of students at a given college start out in low income families and end up in the middle class or end up reaching the top of the income distribution. And from that analysis, which basically involved using data from the Department of Education and Treasury combining those data sources, um, to, to release these now publicly available statistics on these colleges, we documented a set of facts that I think shed light on what really matters in terms of mobility. So the first fact, which is familiar to all of us, is that there is 
um, there's tremendous variation across colleges in terms of access. So there's some colleges that have more low-income students than high-income students, typically community colleges, and then there are other colleges, typically elite private institutions, where you have many more kids from the top 1% of the income distribution than you have from essentially any other part of the uh, income distribution. So that's a fact on access. So then turning to outcomes, which is where I think putting these two things together can be really illuminating, we, we found that the outcomes of low-income kids, the few low-income kids who ended up going to these more selective schools, ended up looking pretty similar to the outcomes of kids from higher-income families, which is really an encouraging fact. It suggests that these kids are not mismatched. They won't underperform at elite institutions. So that at least creates a reason to investigate more carefully how we might increase access for low-income kids more uh, systematically going forward. Third, we found that there's a lot of variation in these mobility rates across colleges. And here, it's important to draw a distinction between what we call mobility in general and upper tail income mobility. So what I mean by that is, if you look at some of the universities we've talked about today, like the City University of New York or Cal State, for example, those universities excel, at least in a descriptive sense in the data, in taking kids from the, say, bottom quintile of the income distribution and helping them reach the upper middle class, say the 75th or 80th percentile. If you just look at the data, where are the most kids moving from the bottom to the middle class? It's not at schools like um, Harvard or Yale, or not even at schools like UC Berkeley or UT Austin. It's more schools like the City University of New York and Cal State and certain community colleges, for example. However, if you look at what we call upper tail mobility, that is reaching, say, the top 1% of the income distribution, or becoming an inventor as measured by having a patent, for example, or starting an influential business, the set of people who end up having those upper tail sort of outcomes are very heavily concentrated at schools like Harvard and Yale, at public flagship institutions, and so some of the conversation we've had earlier today is, you know, should we be thinking about expanding access at just kind of the workhorse schools that have large numbers of students? I think that's absolutely right in terms of the arithmetic of it. You should be focusing on those schools. But if you want to think about kind of the, the people who end up being really influential and may have a lot of power in society, if you think about this from the perspective of democracy, it's very important to also think about access at the elite institutions or the flagship state institutions even though the number of seats there is smaller. And then finally, the fourth fact that emerged from that work is uh, a worrisome fact, which is that trends in terms of access at these institutions that are high mobility institutions are actually quite unfavorable. Despite the many successes we've talked about and the efforts people in this room are implementing to try to improve access, in aggregate, you actually see fewer low income kids at high mobility rate schools today than you did 15 years ago, and that I think is particularly, you know, an, an alarm. It, it motivates the interest in uh, in our conversations today. So that gives you a sense of where we came from. What I want to just take a couple more minutes to do now is give you all a, a broader sense, building on what John and Dave talked about, about where we're headed, where we hope to be headed in partnership with all of you. So let me start again with the big picture kind of umbrella of the Equality of Opportunity Project where CLIMB is one of the key initiatives that we're gonna be focusing on uh, in the next few years, focusing on the role of higher education. But more broadly, we're seeking to expand our work on the neighborhoods dimension, on other dimensions that we haven't explored previously. So for example, some of you might know in the past we've released data by county or by metro area on economic mobility. Next spring, we'll be releasing data on economic opportunity for every census tract in America, so you will be able to see neighborhood by neighborhood what do kids' chances of succeeding look like and what are the neighborhoods where we need to be focusing our attention in order to deliver a better pipeline of kids to colleges, for example, or ultimately to the labor market. As another dimension, a topic that's come up frequently in our discussion today, <coughs> racial uh, differences by race, racial disparities or disparities across ethnicities, another study that we'll be releasing in a few months focuses precisely on that issue of comparisons and economic opportunity by race, something we haven't been able to look at in the past because we haven't had data on race, so we focused mainly on income disparities. But as people were anticipating, there's a very different story underlying racial gaps, very different from what we've focused on in the past on socioeconomic gaps, and I think there are some really important lessons there 
uh, to be learned. Race is clearly a distinct and important issue uh, to think about. Now coming to what we hope to do in the context of higher education, as I said earlier, the mobility report cards work really raised more questions than it answered. We got lots of people uh, asking us after that paper, that paper came out, you know, what does this mean for my college in terms of how I can increase mobility rates? How can I improve my students' outcomes? How can I expand access for low-income kids? What should we do in light of these data? We're really interested. This seems fascinating, but what's the next step? And so that's what motivated John, Dave, and I to come together and say, you know, let's take the next step. Often in academic research, we have a tendency to write a paper and not follow through the next step of implementation. And we really felt passionate about trying to go further here. And we felt that the key to doing that was to bring in additional data, in particular data from individual colleges that would allow us to see information on the set of kids applying to each college, what their outcomes were within that college for admitted students, which we could then link up with the tax and census data that we're working with to look at long-term outcomes. And then importantly, also data from places like the College Board, which could in give us important information on testing data at a national uh, scale and additional information on sort of what the applicant's file looks like. And so what are we hoping to do with these data? You saw a couple of illustrations uh, in John and Dave's presentation. Just to summarize at a bigger picture level, where we hope to go with this, I think of this as it's sort of two different buckets. So the promoting success bucket and the increasing access bucket. So let's start with the promoting success or improving outcomes bucket. So the first step we think in this analysis is to identify what um, President uh, Fembas in his uh, remarks uh, yesterday night called the treatment effects of each college or what's the value added of each college. So what we've documented so far is just how well kids do at some colleges relative to others, which reflects, of course, a combination of the set of children who are being admitted, so the selection of kids who are entering each college, and the treatment effect, that is the value added that each college has or each program has for a given kid. Our vision is that by combining all of the data you all have with the tax records and with the college board data, we are gonna be able to systematically identify the treatment effects, not just each college, but specific programs within each college. You saw an example with the SEEK program at CUNY, for, uh, for instance. Uh, and moreover, the treatment effects by students. So maybe some colleges are particularly helpful for kids from low-income backgrounds, for minority kids, other colleges are more effective with other types of children. So that I see is kind of step one. Now what's really important then is to ask, what is the secret sauce that sort of makes you have better outcomes in some programs relative to others, and how can we replicate that in other places? Or how, even short of that, how can we potentially expand the programs or channel more students, more low-income students in particular, to the high value added program. So I think that's one set of issues on how we can promote success more effectively and the data we're talking about uh, putting together with your partnership is absolutely critical for making that happen. A second set of issues is on increasing access. So let's say we've identified a given college X as a high value added school that's really helping low income kids succeed. It's really important to then figure out how can you get lo more low income kids to attend that college and when I talk to uh, the Dean of Admissions at Stanford, for example, or, or at other colleges, often people express the concern that, yeah, you know, we're committed to this issue. We want to admit more low-income kids, but we just can't find with the metrics we have adequate low-income kids who, a supply of low-income kids who we think will excel here. And so our vision there is by using information from the College Board and other sources, we will look at the students who ended up being successful in the long run. So take a set of students who say, were not admitted to your school in the past, but we can see in the tax records ended up doing really well in the long run. So you sort of wish ex post you had admitted them. What characteristics did these students have in their applicant file? Do they tend to come from certain schools? Do they tend to have a certain profile of SAT scores or ACT scores? Do they um, have certain kinds of extracurricular activities? What kind of information might you be able to use as a school to identify more of those diamonds in the rough? And our hope is by Combining those two sets of results, we will be able to more help colleges basically enhance their impacts on upward mobility and ultimately solve a big piece of the puzzle in reviving the American dream. So hopefully that's useful as Well, that was magisterial, thank you. Um, uh, David, I, talk a little bit about um, College Board's involvement in this. Uh, what about this project 
motivates you most, both at an organizational level and at, at a personal level? What are the yeah. questions that they're asking to which you are most desperate to mm -hmm. know the answers? Well, most of all, the College Board was founded because social mobility was at risk, that uh, colleges got together because they're recruiting from a very small pool of applicants and recognized that threatened our democracy and had the audacity to act in concert and create the College Board. So at the center of our mission is what, Raj, what your life has brought you to, which is the American dream is under great threat, the ideal of social mobility. And um, I just want to first say, like as a matter of College Board policy, to speak formally before I speak personally, uh, we will consistently and in a sustained way support these efforts, period. We're here for the long haul. We will share data with the full support of our members. We will encourage our members to be involved. We will collaborate and our research team will be co-partners in this research going forward, which I have directly as guidance from my own vice president of research. Uh, not my decision alone, their happy decision. But on a person, because this is essential to our mission solving this problem. It is at the heartbeat of it. And but I also would like to say on a personal level that at a difficult time in our society, it is, it is truly wonderful to see such able people of such heart and mind as the team, Raj, you've assembled devote their lives to this question. It's moving. I believe in you. I believe in supporting all of you. I wondered, if you don't mind, whether John and David, whether my own research team and the women and men that work with her, Jess Howell, the College Board research team, if James Kval, who will so ably take over TCAS, you are some of the most impressive people I know. Would you please stand for me, please? I am here because I believe in you, and I think you're amazing, and we'll do all we can to support you. Because no great thing has ever been done unless a small group of highly able people decide to band together in a sustained way work on it. So that's the deepest reason I'm here, to propel this forward any way I can, any way we can. And the core of our work at the College Board is a little bit more about what happens in high school before you get into college. So I'll just talk about that briefly, a couple of patterns we're seeing, and then Raj, if it's cool, and Derek, I have three or so questions about different segments of higher ed that I'm dying to see answered, so I will, I will leave you with those three questions. Um, we felt that the SAT, along with most of our society, had gotten to the point where it was recertifying inequalities that existed in our society rather than disrupting them. I'm trying to put it as bluntly as I can. It was founded to disrupt who goes, but with expensive test preparation available to some, with all sorts of dynamics around the test, we thought it was mostly perceived as merely kind of certifying those who already had resources. So you know we redesigned the test to utterly abandon its aptitude heritage and go, rather than something that was hard to measure and hard to change, a test of simple math reading and writing skills that are easy to change through practice. And then we worked with Khan Academy to make practice free. And what I want all of us to observe after that happened is the way adolescents responded to that call, because that's what gives me hope. Five million kids have signed up for that free practice. We have, we have analytic findings that, on average, those students who devote 20 hours to such personalized practice grow, on average, 115 points on the 1600 scale, more than twice those who do not. Um, I want to be clear those are not purely causal findings. To do that, we have to understand the role of motivation much better and other factors. But what's great about this is we don't look at motivation as a confounding variable. We're looking at how can we inspire a whole greater set of students to practice and be motivated in this way. And we're looking at all sorts of incentives to do that. There are 16,000 kids in this country who grew more than 200 points on that scale. And it is very moving to watch adolescents respond and claim their power. In another area of our work in AP, I've long worried that the STEM discussion, you know, we've been lecturing adolescents for about a generation since the, does anyone old enough like me to know the Gathering Storm Report by Norm Augustin? You know, our country's gonna suffer, we should all do STEM. And you'd think that if you're all economists, why when you say to adolescents, you're gonna be rich, just do STEM, you'll get a great job, you'll be a happy person. Why have the numbers not changed? In fact, there are fewer women engineers now than before. It's as discouraging as your low income participation data. And so we at the College Board realized that if you've been inviting someone to a party for 20 years and they're not coming, that is, when we have an AP computer science course and, you know, it's only, the only kids in it, roughly speaking, are young white men and Asian men, something has to give. So we designed a new invitation, we designed a new course called AP Computer Science Principles. That course does not say, would you like to do advanced grammar in a language you're not interested in? 
call that Java, which only appeals if you're already in, if you're already interested. It says, would you like to build an app? Whatever you're interested in, would you like to build an app? If you're a scientist, if you're into the arts, whatever your thing is, would you like to build an app? Students responded very differently. We went from 2,000 black people in this country doing advanced computer science last year to 5,000 African Americans this year. We went from 5,000, um, I want to just make sure I get this, yes, that's right, 5,000 Latinos to 14,000 in a single year. We went from 13,000 young women showing their advanced work in computer science to 27,000 in a single year. That's what's at stake in changing who you invite and how you invite them, it seems to me. So we could not be more interested than disruptive possibilities in changing the opportunity pipeline. You may know that we also invest heavily in the College Advising Corps in any effort we can make to get low-income students to apply broadly, to spur them to apply, whether that's fee waivers or any incentives we're, we're, we're investing in virtual advising. You may ask rightly what this has to do with our bottom line. You are right to ask, um, because it doesn't. Because it may not be in our economic interest where kids go to college, but it's at the center of our mission, that they make far better choices. Now to turn to you and the kind of questions that I'm dying to learn about research, through research. One of them is about transfer policy from community colleges. We are very interested in the College Board that there are large numbers of very able young people who choose community college but also could have chosen a selective college. And we think those students could go anywhere and should go anywhere after their time at community college. And by the way, it might be a heck of a lot cheaper if their credits transferred the right way and offer many avenues towards excellence. And I would say it is my strong belief that the best of them could go absolutely anywhere. So why isn't it time that the walls come down? Why not broadly across this country do we not let the strongest of community colleges earn their future and go where they can? So that's question number one. And does your data, when you say there may not, you know, when, when colleges say, you don't say this, Raj, but I do want to point out they can't find that it's so hard to find these capable kids, why are we not looking at the best of community college students if we're truly searching for such young people. Number two, in terms of large publics and the public flagships and their incredibly powerful networks of schools, you've shown today good news about UT Austin. We've talked about UNC and the Covenant. We've talked about the University of California system. But unless I read your data wrong, which I would love to be corrected, there are enormous gulfs in the role of large publics in their states. That is, the proportion of the bottom 50% of income is radically different across these states. I don't think that's because, forgive me those of you at those ones that overperform in this area, that there are kinder, better people running those institutions in California, in UNC. It, it does have to do with Carolina Covenant. It does have to do with policy decisions in California. How do we, in, how do we for Republicans and Democrats alike, make a viable policy set of imperatives that allows public institutions to, to everywhere or am I wrong? But isn't that, wouldn't that be an incredibly urgent, given the numbers at stake here, to put public, to create more public systems and give them the power and resources they need to be like the University of California in their effects? And then third, to be a little hard-hitting, um, you have a line in your report. You say that the elite, there is not one of the Ivy Plus colleges, I think about 11 colleges in all, where uh, there is a substantial share of poor children from this country, from the bottom 50%. I want to think bottom 50%, guys. I want to be as broad brush as possible, because the fact is in your paper, how many times is it more likely for me to be in those colleges if I'm in the top 1% versus the bottom 50%? It's so, under 70. 70, 70 something percent. Yeah. So I just want to pause over that statement. So if that is so, that it is 77% more likely. 77 the, times. The, 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 77 the line, times. The, the, the sentence is, Children whose parents are in the top 1% of the income distribution are 77 times more likely to attend an Ivy League college than those in the bottom income quintile. And I want to remind us as we note that data that we all remember that they are disproportionately able at one thing, which is, which is staffing what you called uh, the high tail, the upper tail, upper tail elite, because uh, there's a deep issue of fairness. So to me, I've been trying to think about this analytically. There are only four possible causes for that truth. One is there are not enough talented kids, even for the small subset of kids who meet their standards. So the kids are not there because the advantages of wealth in developing merit are so profound. Number two, you can't find them. We recruit them. They are there, but they cannot be seen by us. Number three, we can't afford them, though we'd have to be cautious in saying this publicly given some of the endowment sizes we are discussing. 
And number four, our seats are too precious and claimed by others. That is, given the people who have that the most precious asset of these institutions is not financial aid, but the seats. Who gets to sit in these colleges? I'll tell you one thing. I am very interested in an analytic exploration of these four areas and a careful look at them. The College Board will support that entirely. But I will tell you, I think the likely conclusion is that the SAT must reassert its role to assert merit over privilege. That is, I think it is highly unlikely that any analytic effort will show that sufficient merit does not exist in the bottom half of the American population to be well represented at our top schools in America, period. And it is time to show that, to confront that, to do anything we can to help our members have the resources and, and, and they need to make those decisions. That's just one man's view. But I want to understand how your research will prove or disprove that and enforce the question at what point, as we ourselves think of a sector, I want to try to challenge the audience here. There's a startlingly good news quality to this research, in my humble opinion. It shows that college is the one large scale technology, God bless us, that transforms trajectory, that overcomes the power even of race and class in the society. That amazing data, the funnel showing, I mean, it's so beautiful to watch. Despite the disparities coming in, that UT degree evens it out at the end and they get to the same income. It's almost a fairy tale. That's the promise of this sector. But knowing that, that there are fewer low income kids, a lower share of them in this sector than 15 years ago, something is very badly wrong. And so my question is, how can we seriously, and if it's a matter of resources, I don't think it's a matter of mere ethics. What are the policies, what are the supports we need in place to change that if we're going to re-earn our mantle as a source of social mobility? Raj, if you'd like to respond to... Good I'm, luck. I'm particularly interested, right. Well, let me, let me, um, I, 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 let me, let me rephrase uh, an element of the question. I'm interested in two things. First, what is a methodologically sound way to prove an assumption in David's case, which very well might be true, which is that there is this untapped population of extremely talented low-income low -income students who aren't attending flagship public universities, elite universities. What, what is a way that the data could, could represent that, number one? Um, and then number two, what is a smart way of proving that the effect of successful schools, like the UT, like in the graphs that we saw here, that that effect is not merely a talented admission staff, which is just net, just getting some incredibly brilliant low-income minority students who are and potentially inevitably going to succeed, or merely the sheepskin effect of going to work in the state of Texas with a UT degree is such it's such a powerful imprimatur that it doesn't matter what the education is behind it, you're going to get that $55,000 salary upon graduation. Mm -hmm. What are some ways to, for, that your data can show us both this, the population of talented low-income students and the true value add um, uh, of, of these institutions? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, David, I really appreciate your comments and the College Board's support in this effort, which I think is just going to be critical. Um, I, a lot of what you said resonates with me in terms of key questions to answer. These are the types of issues we'll be investigating. Let me t take the two specific angles that, that Derek raised. So first, uh, how can we definitively assess the extent to which there's a supply of high achieving, low income kids and how can we find those kids and perhaps make them available in a sense to uh, admissions officials? So concretely, the way we're thinking about this is Let's say you take uh, a college like UT Austin, for instance, uh, and take a set of students who, say back in 2000, were not admitted to the school, um, or take you know, some other institution like Stanford or Harvard, for example, where there might be more discretion uh, in admissions, and find the set of kids who were not admitted. Okay? So now track those kids forward using the tax records and other government data we work with, we're gonna be able to track those kids just like we can track the kids who were admitted. And identify the subset of children who ended up being really successful by whatever metric you'd like to use for success. So we've been focusing today on earnings as a measure of success. We all know that earnings is not the only measure of success. You might think of other measures of accomplishment. Are you contributing to society in other ways? 
for instance, if you become an uh, influential scientist or working at an important nonprofit. So there are other things you might be able to measure in the data. So settle on some measure of upward mobility and identify first the subset of kids who look like they did really well despite not getting into, let's say, an institution like Stanford. Now, let's make the assumption, which I think is reasonable and that Stanford would, would presumably like to make, that those children would have done, if at all, better had they gone to Stanford instead of uh, going elsewhere, that there's some positive value added of the institution. Then those are sort of the mistakes that you made in admissions, right? Those are the kids you sort of wish you had admitted. They ended up doing really well. And particularly, we can focus on the kids who came from low-income backgrounds and, and did really well. And so you wish ex post you had admitted those kids. Now, obviously, that information in and of itself is not that useful because it's too late. You can't do much about it now. But what you can do is going back to data like the College Board data and other information in the application files of these kids, you can ask, are there certain systematic characteristics that predict these types of false negatives, these types of mistakes? Do, do these kids tend to come from certain types of schools? Do they tend to have a particular type of uh, SAT score? So you might uh, think, for example, that higher income kids, because they get to retake standardized tests or have more prep, end up with higher test scores than lower income kids. So is there a way you might be able to adjust their test scores or adjust for their background so that you pick out more of these diamonds in the rough, essentially? And our sense is by combining all of this data with modern machine learning statistical methods, we will be able to really precisely quantify the supply of such students and not just quantify that supply, but potentially give colleges very precise tools to identify in your area, in the set of wow. students around, you know, in Texas, for example, versus students in California, these are the types of factors you should be focusing on. So that's the sense in which I think you can give a very scientific, precise answer to your first question. And so just to, just to be clear about this point, because you said something I wasn't expecting, you anticipate that you might not only be able to demonstrate a national population of high achieving low income students, but you might even be able to tell colleges, essentially give them the equivalent of a geographical heat map. Here is yes. where they are more likely to be. Yes. Um, that's really interesting. And not just by geography, but on other characteristics as well, right? This is the type of profile you should be looking for, maybe in terms of outreach to get more kids of that type to apply or change admission standards for this particular type of kids. That's where you kind of have the overachievers relative to what you might currently expect. Yeah, and, and just to pause one more time, it's interesting because one of the implications of your mobility reports card paper, um, one of the findings explicitly, was that uh, low income students achieved at, at essentially the same level mm -hmm. as high income students at these, um, at, at these institutions. That suggests to me, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, it's unlikely that admissions departments in the US are so good that they batted 100% and have selected only those low income, high achieving students that would earn at the same level as their higher income peers. Mm -hmm. And they just batted 100%, there's no one left. Mm -hmm. It is much more likely that even if admissions departments are staffed with brilliant, brilliant people, that they batted at some percentage less than 100%, mm -hmm. let's say 80, 60, mm -hmm. 55, in which case there are thousands more of these students who are out there. That seems to me to be an almost explicit implication of the research finding. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the question nevertheless is how do you identify those kids? And I completely understand that it's, it could be difficult to identify those kids. There's a lot of noise in this process. There are lots of considerations. So, you know, I think that's why this type of empirical quantification is useful. It also connects, Derek, to the second question you raised. When we see this pattern that outcomes at UT look just about as good for low-income or minority kids as higher-income kids, is that showing you that UT has a really positive treatment effect mm -hmm. on those lower income kids? Or is it about selection? And so, you know, David, this relates to some of the issues you were raising earlier as well. Uh, you asked, how can we definitively establish that there's a positive effect of attending these institutions or a particular program? So again, to give you an example, you might use something like an admissions cutoff where some group of very similar kids barely got into UT versus didn't get into UT, uh, and you're able to compare the long-term trajectories of those two sets of children to isolate the treatment effect of attending UT as opposed to the ability to select really talented kids. So that's the type of analysis and variance of that that we'd hope to do. To and and there are simplicity. simpler approaches just to say it. So for example, we'll be looking very carefully about 
and I imagine my colleagues at ACT would be similarly interested in, well, we'd be glad to look at the bottom half of income in this country and show you lots of kids who do very well on our instruments, just to say it, because yeah. that would already give you pause. Yeah. Uh, before I, I just want to be careful, Raj, of not getting too exquisite in the face of the astonishing conclusion that there are enough, not, not enough kids who could thrive at our best colleges in the bottom half of the American human race. Because what, what I fear about that is an overly precious view of merit. And I think it's important for me to say this as a college board president. For example, if you argue in the top 1%, like let's say there are enough high scoring kids, they'll do great at these institutions. And I know they are. Or I, let's just say before my research team confirms it, I have a strong predilection to believe it. Um, then you might say, well, they might not have quite the span of extracurriculars. But you know what, guys? I think we should really reconsider on the Common App for college that there should be three boxes for extracurriculars, not 12. There should be space for three things you are devoted to. One of, we only have evidence of the College Board that one thing outside of your academic work that you have a sustained commitment to changes your likelihood to succeed in college. Why have we created this unproductive arms race of busyness in adolescence? It would be great for the rich kids too, by the way. I mean, the saddest thing I hear from parents is that their kids are too busy. Why not have more time for fun and for family, for faith, for anything but getting into college? Um, and, and those devotions might be things like your family or work that you do over time, by the way not necessarily an activity you pay for. So I just think that there's time for a little soul searching uh, in addition to research about how have we constructed a world of merit that could even have allowed this to begin. Um, so I want to press us on that to consider that. And um, I want to press another question. Uh, David, if I could just jump in for one no, please, second uh, related to that. So on the issue of merit, I completely agree that it's implausible that merit is so concentrated in the top 1% in terms of innate ability or intrinsic ability. But relating to an issue that came up a number of times earlier today, I think we also have to remember that the students who colleges are considering admitting have experienced 18 years of no diff question. very different backgrounds, right? Yeah. Relating to other aspects of what we work on on our team of neighborhoods and schools no and the various other disparities that have played out. And so if you think about merit at the time of entering college, no question. I absolutely agree that there's, you know, we need to investigate this very carefully, but it might be less extreme than, than one would think. I think upfront. despite the ravages of inequality, let's remember we're talking about staffing only the very top colleges. Yes. So I'm not trying to say the bottom 50% has equal life chances, mm -hmm. but there is a group of them, and I think it's much larger than we're considering, that resist and even are strengthened by those forces. But let's yeah. keep that debate aside, but that's my strong hypothesis. And if that is so, we have a reckoning to have. We have a hard set of discussions about what is true about higher education in America because if it were true that there were such kids, that we could find them, and nonetheless that they are not there, then we have to ask if our best colleges are advancing socioeconomic mm -hmm. diversity and strength or the opposite. I just want to press the case mm -hmm. till we look in the mirror and ask ourselves, be so careful to earn our rightful role. I'm so proud of it, by the way. I hope my colleagues in higher education and K-12 get my pride in the role of college, but we must earn it by our results and who's there. And I'll ask a question about that that I think is a bit hard hitting. Let's not underestimate the value of sheepskin, Derek. You kind of threw it aside as if, I mean, if a degree gets you a great job and it can overcome inequality, the sheepskin's great. Mm -hmm. But I want to ask us as an audience how far we want to take that. You could almost take from this research that we should give out degrees en masse because there's such a great inequality in answer. Let great inflation go amok. Give out degrees as much as possible to, to a wide range of kids. It would lead to social equality. And I face this in my daily work, so I thought I'd throw out a hard question that I'm facing. We've decided, and I worry about debt without degree, so I worry that, that, that we've got another problem that we're staring at, which is that investing in all kids, regardless of readiness when they don't complete, can lead to catastrophic effects. Uh, where they partially complete degrees. We talk about the private sector colleges doing it, but I just want to be clear, it's also done by the fact that if you're not ready and you're in remediation, you maybe shouldn't be there. And colleges have not at scale reversed those forces in it. So, so what is the standard of readiness we believe in? And I'll give you an example. In dual credit, for example, and I face this every day, 97% of the kids get credit. Now, I know some of the partners in dual credit do it very differently and have stairs. I'm talking about a global effect here which could be different at every institution. Whereas in advanced placement, 57% of students earn credit. Should the college board hold that line? 
is that appropriate? Is it, it does the meaningful, we see much better completion rates, et cetera, but is it better to hold that line of standards and say there is something to earning a college credit that's demonstrable, that's shareable, that predicts certain success in advanced courses, or do you leave it kind of wide open because getting a degree is such a powerful advancement? Um, we have, that, that's the last, uh, uh, the, I think we have, what, 15 minutes left yeah. for a Q&A? Um, and I definitely want to give people uh, a chance to, to ask questions here. So um, put your hand up, and we, I think we have someone walking around with the mic if you have a question. I was hoping Raj would answer me. <laughs> well, while we're waiting for the mic to go, I mean, I would just briefly say, you know, I think sheepskin effects could be part of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. I think the... The question is scalability. I mean, they, they fundamentally rely on reputation, right? Imagine exactly that UT right. were just to hand out degrees to anyone who walked in the door. Presumably, the, even the sheepskin effect of getting that degree would become exactly much, right. much lower, right? Exactly so right. You, you get that effect precisely because of the expectation that exactly there's a certain right. educational product that's being de delivered. Well, and so it's tricky to figure out how you sustain that in equilibrium. Hi, Rebecca Karoff. I'm with the University of Texas System Office. Um, I'm just struggling a little bit with the focus on, and it's the language that's being used up there, high achieving kids from low incomes. What about all the non high achieving kids who are populating all our other institutions, community colleges across the country, other schools in my system that aren't UT Austin, that are doing phenomenal things, UTEP, UTRGV, you know, in terms of re raising the mobility the mobility. So I'm just wondering, how do yep, you, absolutely. can you, do we need to say high achieving? Do we, is yeah. there another way to spin it? So I think high achieving is relevant for a small subset of schools that we've maybe spent disproportionate amount of time on. But um, if you look at our data, exactly as you're saying, it's places like UTEP, it's places like CUNY that are really the engines of mobility in a much larger scale. And those kids are in a broad sense high achieving but are not necessarily at the very top of the distribution of applicants, of course. And I think it's critical to devote most of our attention, if we want to think about improving mobility at large, to that set of institutions, simply because of the numbers. This is a point that came up earlier. And because if you think about the cost of education, the cost of education at the elite private schools per student is you know, something like seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 per student at schools like CUNY or UTEP, it's cl closer to on the order of $10,000 a student. So if you're thinking about a scalable model that you're actually going to be able to use to educate large number of students and, and give them chances of rising up, you're exactly right. That's the group of uh, students you should be focusing on. And that is uh, you know, primarily what our attention will be focused on. So and thank I, you for clarifying. And I just want to say where I was just getting to, I think, is quite relevant to what you're talking about. That is, for that very large body of students who transformatively go to college, who are ready for college, but then how far down should we go in terms of performance too? That is, I couldn't agree with you more, high achieving is a, is a lark that discusses some of this. But I do think we have to have a serious discussion about we, whether we invest funds in the college ready and near to college ready, but then when you go beneath that, how often do we really turn around those trajectories in college? Or how often does that lead to debt without degree, whether it's at UTEP or other places? In other words, what's, what's that limit, I think, is a deep question. However, I would say to you, just along with my community college friends here, that there might be wonderful alternatives for students who might have command over less math. For example, certain kinds of career training and technical degrees that could be extremely exciting pathways. And maybe we should be very careful of imposing false requirements in math or other areas that force them into remediation rather than productive avenues there. So I couldn't agree with you more. I would love to see a broad view of how we advance you know, talent from all segments of our society across. And I think in the large publics outside of the Texas system, outside of California and UNC, you see a real problem with poor, poor attendance or low income attendance in the bottom 50% across those systems. So these issues are prevalent over here. Um, as darkness descends, I can't see Hi. the hands. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, uh, Eloy Oakley, California Community Colleges. Um, I'd like to respectfully uh, push back on David a little bit and, and ask you a question. <clears throat> so we're talking about merit over privilege. Uh, and um, uh, we talk about the tests that we assign to students to try to measure merit, but inherently, high stakes tests rarely show that we are truly measuring 
a student's potential to succeed in higher education. So are we really changing the game or are we just smoothing it out a little bit? And I, I applaud you for partnering with yeah. Khan Academy and doing everything that you're doing, but until we find a better system or better way to measure the potential of every student, we are still sorting students, whether we want to yeah. call it that or not. We are sorting them yeah. and we are determining who goes and who doesn't. And my final point is, you mentioned transfer. Well, and I'm going to use my daughter as an example. Yeah. Um, she oh, was college ready. The light is blind. She was college ready to go to Cal yeah. um, right out of high school. But the pressure and the challenges of trying to score high enough on the SAT to get into Cal just completely blew her away. Hmm. But she transferred to Cal. Yeah. She's the same person yeah, yeah. doing quite well at Cal. Yeah. But we decided that through the high stakes exams that we give these students, we're creating a sorry mechanism. So how do we get beyond that? Yeah, these are deep questions and I don't want to take too long in answering your profound questions. Let me just say a quick word about what I was saying about privilege over merit. What I was trying to say is that at least use the SAT for one ancient purpose, which is to scandalize the idea that there are no talented kids at the top. I, that's particularly what I meant with that sentence is if, if our colleges are saying there are no such kids but from the top 1% of income, a small service we can offer is show a lot of high scoring kids across the income spectrum. I didn't say that because I prefer it as the standard of merit. I preferred it as a source of questioning. Am I making sense? Then grades and other things should be looked at. Of course, I'm not trying to say I've never been anything but for whole admissions and, and just to be clear, I was, that's what I meant in that regard. You're asking a different question which is, can instruments like the SAT ever be ethical in being part of the admissions process, in a sense? I think is, am I correct in, in a deeper way? And despite my efforts, you're still deeply concerned about their role in young people's lives. And I just want to say I think about it every day. So I just don't want, to, I don't want you to feel you're alone in worrying every day about unproductive anxiety and what I can do to heal it. My sense of it is this. I think assessments like the SAT, unchecked and too dominant, are entirely corrupting. So if anyone asked to rely on them alone, I would say it's wrong. But I do fear similarly about grades unchecked by any standard measure like the SAT. Because we're finding in wealthier schools, grades are rising while SAT scores are not. And it's disproportionate. It is by income. So in public schools, you see that the least effect. So grade inflation to me is the other specter we have to be cautious of as we move away from a standard assessment. And I've told you what I said about dual credit, you know what I mean? In other words, without the objective standard of earning a three or better on AP, 97% wind up passing rather than 57%. So I don't want to dismiss your principled concerns because I take them quite seriously and I'm trying to every day reduce unproductive anxiety with a productive sense of confidence and practice. And I believe that the false intimidations of these instruments are destructive. For example, one of the worst things the testing industry has done is to confuse quick and smart. And so we've added 47% more time for question, but we're part of the way there. But these are the kinds of things that obsess me. So I agree with you, but I want you to worry along with me too about what a pure reliance on grades would truly do to the most poor and deserving as well. Yeah, no, I hear you. I, I'm worried about grade inflation at lower uh, levels of the system, sir. We should keep talking. If I could just say a quick word on the second question on transfers. I mean, one of the things we see in our data is that California community colleges in particular look fantastic in general on, on mobility rates. And our sense is that might be because of, precisely because of transfers. And so one of the things we hope to dig into in this next round of research is understanding how much of the effect we're seeing is through transfers and what implications the, does that have for expanding transfers in other community college systems in other states. Um, so I think you're hitting on a, on a critical issue that, that resonates very much with the data. Right back there, please. Oh, I'm sorry, no, right there. Hi. I'm curious about um, how you are gonna think about or account for, as you identify schools that are sort of overachieving in taking low-income kids and, mm -hmm. um, and, and their social mobility, how you will sort of account for where those schools are located and what the role of the actual like labor economy that they're in. And I ask that because I think 
that one of the things that gets missing from this conversation often is just literally what's up with the job market, what's yeah, changing with the job market, where the job market is strong, and if we're talking about why mm -hmm. people in rural areas, you know, are like against higher education or whatever, mm -hmm. and because going to college means your kid is gone, like the mm -hmm. way in which our society is becoming that we provide op opportunity for people in urban areas but not other places. Yeah. So how do you take account of that? Excellent question. So you know, that gets back to what the limitation of the analysis we've done so far. So you see, for example, that some of the colleges with the highest mobility rates are in places like New York, or the, the best outcomes for kids. And so you know, that's perhaps not surprising because of the availability of jobs in New York. So I'll say two things on that. So first, even if you look within the colleges in the New York area, there are lots of colleges that are lower mobility relative to uh, places like CUNY. So it's not entirely a labor market in effect. In fact, most of the variation is within labor markets. But going forward, we want to be much more precise about tackling exactly that kind of issue. And this also relates to Derek's earlier question on how we identify the treatment effects of schools. We want to compare very similar kids. So take a child who barely got into one school versus didn't get in and ended up attending a different college within New York, say. That gives you more of a controlled experiment where you can compare two kids who had very similar options, came from the same city, for instance. And so you're comparing apples with apples, essentially, and can isolate the effect that attending a particular institution had. So the broader idea here is to develop statistical methods that we can use to identify those types of carefully controlled treatment effects across all colleges in America, some of which you know, we might have these kinds of cutoffs that allow us to compare kids who barely got in versus kids who didn't. And in other places, we do things like control for SAT scores, uh, hometown that you came from, school grades, other information we have to come as close as we can to an apples to apples comparison. So that's precisely the type of issue we're trying to address in this next phase of the research. Over here. Okay, so uh, Zakia Smith, Lumina Foundation, and I'm I'm wondering um, the someone made a kind of almost an offhand comment about how uh, more selective institutions or institutions that tend to do some that tend to do the best in some of the outcome measures spend so much per student, right? And um, the places where students don't do as well probably spend much less per student, and also have fewer resources to to spend on students. So it's not entirely surprising. Um, and when we talk about kind of whether students are college ready and things like that. We've talked a lot about whether at Lumina, colleges are student ready, like how can we help think about what colleges are doing? And if we weren't in higher ed, like if we were thinking about this in a K-12 context, it would be, I think, completely foreign to talk about whether um, students are ready enough to enter, like, I mean, we do talk about student readiness in third grade, but when we think about the solutions, we don't think about sorting the students differently in types of schools. We say, what resources do the schools have, and can we do a better job in giving them the resources that they need? So if the California community colleges aren't doing as well as the CSUs, who aren't doing as well as the UCs, say, well, what does the funding look like at those institutions, and can we do a better job? Like, does it make sense that students that score very high on the SAT get the most amount of money and resources heaped on them in higher ed, and the students who, have, who need the most get the least amount of money, and the institutions that have the least? And so I guess I'm asking a bigger question, which is, should we not be thinking differently about the resources that institutions get to serve the neediest students, mm -hmm. um, rather than kind of the students who are already probably going to do pretty good, and if you just put them in a library somewhere, they'll get a degree four years later, versus you know, students that really, really need intensive you know, work and studying, to, or, or tutors and stuff like that to help them succeed. So let me first just clarify something in the data because I think I, I made that offhand comment. So it's true that the most selective colleges that channel the most kids to the upper tail tend to have very high costs and high expenditures per student. But there are lots of colleges that spend significantly really less that have high mobility rates. So there actually is not a very strong correlation between expenditures and mobility rates. You can find a number of colleges in the data that don't have astronomically high expenditures and have quite good outcomes, CUNY, Cal State, UTEP being uh, examples of that. That said, I think you're hitting on a, a critical issue, which is ideally going forward, you would direct resources to colleges based on how much they're achieving the mission of helping kids, and in particular low-income kids, succeed, rather than purely on the basis of inputs, like the number of students who, you've, who you have enrolled. And we've heard a number of others make that sort of remark, how it kind of distorts incentives 
So, uh, you know, when a university graduates students more quickly, that might actually reduce their funding rather than increase their funding because they have fewer students enrolled at any given point in time. And so more broadly, you know, David and I were talking about this earlier. You know, we're, one way to think about an outcome of this research is at kind of the micro level, institution by institution, how can we improve outcomes? And I think that's a very important aspect of what we can do. But there's also a systemic change in incentives that I think is important to think about. So if we can use this data to settle on some outcome measures like earnings outcomes or mobility rates that people really find meaningful, then you could imagine eventually having funding that is at least partly related to those outcomes and not purely a function of enrollment. That is, if you're a high mobility rate school or you're a high value added school for low income kids, you end up getting more support for the state, for example. You know, that could be an element of the direction in which funding goes. Or more generally, or in a different vein, you could think about changing, trying to influence ranking systems. So we were encouraged that recently, Money Magazine started to put about a 20% weight on mobility rates, the statistics that we released for colleges on, on one of the elements in its ranking. And that changed things quite a bit. CUNY, for example, moves up a lot in the ranking when you do that. Now, I think that's important because that changes the incentives that colleges have. Now, admitting more low-income kids actually moves you up in the rankings rather, rather than down in the rankings, which is the way it traditionally works when you use you know, existing measures like average scores and performance and, and things like that. So here, here. Yeah. Right there. Raj, um, I'm aware that, especially after this session, your list of additional research questions is very long. Um, but I do want to make the case for uh, one group of students, um, and that's the uh, students 25 years and older. Um, I've actually noticed throughout the, uh, the conference here that we've uh, used the word kids a lot, uh, mm -hmm. but given that 40% uh, of students in the United States are now 25, percent, uh, 25 uh, years and older, uh, I think that's something that we ought to look at. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you've already done that or whether that is uh, on your list of uh, research questions. Uh, so thank you for pushing us on that. So most of our work to date has focused on the traditional college going uh, ages of 18 to 22. A lot of the results John and Dave were presenting, for instance, use that definition. There's no inherent limitation in the data that says that you have to focus on that group. That was a simple place to start for data reasons. We have certain measures that we've published that look at students up to age 28. Partly we're constrained by the time span of the data, so, so to look at much older students, for instance, um, you have to go basically further back in order to have the full set of years. But going forward, I, I absolutely agree that it's important to pay attention, particularly when you think about community colleges, for instance, uh, you're missing a huge part of the student body if you don't look at, uh, at students who attend at older ages, and so that's absolutely something that we can do and that we will hope to do uh, going forward. So thanks for raising that. Right there. Uh, thank you both, uh, David and Raj, for a terrific uh, wrap up to a terrific day. Uh, Raj, a quick question about your, your research. Those of us in the field have a tendency to simplify or want to oversimplify important research like yours. But bear with me, to that end, as we depart here today, what's the single metric mm the single marker in your research that college leaders, state leaders like me, can use to gauge the success on upper mobility. For example, I'm on your website, Glendale, shout out to California, is ranked very high mm -hmm. on a mobility rate, but then later there's an overall mobility index. It gets confusing. Mm -hmm. can you, what one metric yeah. should we if leave here to, with? If I had to pick one number, I would pick the mobility rate. So what is the mobility rate? The way we've defined it is what fraction of kids in your student body came from a low-income family, in particular from the bottom quintile, and ended up at a high income level, that is, ended up in the top quintile. So if you've got 100 students and 10 of them started out poor and ended up rich, your mobility rate would be 10%. That's the kind of number you see at a place like Glendale Community College in Los Angeles, which is uh, the example you just, you just gave. It's a very high mobility rate because you're taking lots of kids who started out or in helping them reach the upper part of the income distribution. Why is that an attractive statistic? Because it combines the two key ingredients that we've been talking about throughout the state, access and success, access and outcomes. If you just look at access, then you can just admit a lot of low-income kids and have very low completion rates and poor outcomes, and that doesn't really win the battle in terms of increasing mobility. 
And if you just look at success, which is actually what I think people traditionally do, like kids at this college seem to do really well, then you go completely in the other direction where there's no particular force to admitting lower income kids. And so there are, these are two different measures that are critical ingredients in thinking about upward mobility. You can combine them in many, many different ways. Essentially what this measure does is it multiplies the two of them. So you get more credit if you're good on both access and success rates, which is what constitutes the mobility rate. And that's the statistic that Money Magazine has included in its ranking for precisely the reasons that I just described. So while I wouldn't want to distill our research to, to one number, <laughs> I recognize that that's often uh, necessary and that's the number I'd encourage you to use. Just a quick question, because I, I, I remember that page of the appendix, but I did not memorize it, uh, shame on me. <laughs> um, the, by that definition of, uh, the, of the mobility metric, it suggests that a school of 100 that delivers this outcome for 10 students um, is of equal quality to a school of 50,000 that delivers that outcome for 5,000 because, because it's in percentages because it's rather than ratio. counts. Right. And so you know, that's a scaling choice, right? If we just did it in terms of numbers, then you'd end up with the Ohio states and Arizona states automatically sort of at the top of the list. Because if you're a relatively small college, you just simply don't have the number of students. So we felt you should norm things relative to the population of students that a college is actually working with and say, for the number of seats you have, how are you contributing to economic mobility? A separate issue is that some colleges are much bigger than others, which of course we should keep in mind as well. Right. Do we have other questions? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, there's lots of backlight. <laughs> Hi, Carolyn Conrad with UT Austin. Have you done any research about looking at the amount of financial support that's given to these low-income students? We have plenty of fabulous students who can't afford to come here yeah. because we don't have enough financial aid, we don't have enough scholarship dollars. So it's one thing to have those students who go to Harvard who have get full rides. Of course, that mm -hmm. helps a lot. So I don't know if you've been able to or if you have mm -hmm. the data to say, well, if we give them an extra 5,000, right. we give them the percentage towards that cost of attendance. Right. So there's other excellent work that's been done, for instance, by Dave Deming, Sue Donarski, others who are here on exactly that issue, suggesting that tuition changes, as you might expect, intuitively do matter uh, in many cases. One thing we find in our data, which is a note of caution, because you mentioned the Harvard example, is that uh, many of you will know that over the 2000s, many of the top private institutions cut tuition, essentially gave lower income and middle income students free rides to attend those schools. And we can look in our data what happened to the fraction of low-income and middle-income students at those colleges over the past 15 years. And the surprising fact is actually the number of low-income kids did not change all that much at those institutions. At Harvard, it went up a little bit, but our sense is much of that might have come at the expense of places like Princeton and Brown. And you know, essentially, the students were shuffling between these uh, elite private institutions. And so my, my own sense is that Tuition is obviously central. If you know it's completely unaffordable to attend UT, then many kids are not going to be able to come. But it's not adequate to have low levels of tuition. You need additional support. You need outreach to actually get kids to apply. And then you need kids to feel included and feel supported once they're here. So you know, some other work we're doing, we're working with Facebook data to look at networks and look at how kids are connecting with each other at colleges, in neighborhoods, and in other institutions. What you often find is even once you show up at a place like this, kids for, from lower income backgrounds are more disconnected from the network and that can be predictive of dropping out and things like that. So I think money matters, tuition matters, but it's a first step in a broader, uh, more complicated and, puzzle. And just you all know it, but to say it again in a clear voice, advice matters so much by a caring adult or a near yeah. peer. And because the perceptions of finances and the perceptions of these choices, the poorer you get, the worse they are in terms of kids getting a reliable picture of the investments and what college pays and what will return. I know you know that, but it's one of those, it's interesting, as unfair as we thought costly test preparation was, we've now come to think that the, the inequalities of advice that kids received are at least as moves us to action, and so we've been putting a lot of energy into that, getting better advice to young people so they can make these calculations. Absolutely. And their families, of course. And adults, at some point, we're working on it to get there. Do I see one more? All right. Thank you both so much, and thank you. Thanks,